Okay, today we're going to look at uh, one of the causes for the P2076 on a 2013 Chevy Sonic. Uh, it's the uh, disconnected uh, connector rod on the intake manifold. Um, what this video is going to show is one uh, way to resolve the issue if it applies to you. Uh, we're going to take a look at the intake manifold both in and out of the car. And I'm going to show you how to use the scanner to prepare the car for inspection. What the video is not going to do is actually show you the removal uh, of the manifold, but I think if you are contemplating it, it's worth looking at because it has some sonic unique um, details that you won't find in uh, online very easily. Uh, remember, it's uh, you know it's your car. Uh, be safe. Make sure the engine's cool. Your eye, wear an eye protection, etc. Um, you know, do the right thing as far as safety is concerned. Okay, here's all the legal disclaimer stuff. I'm not a mechanic. You know, this is an as-is video. Use it or lose it as uh, suits you. Hopefully it will help you uh, with this project of resolving the P2076 error. Okay, I don't know if you can read that, but it says P2076 intake manifold, uh, manifold tuning valve position sensor switch circuit range performance bank 1A. Um, that's one of one codes in the upper right there. On other occasions, I've gotten P0101 as well, which is the uh, mass airflow uh, being out of whack. Okay, so the part that was causing my uh, P2076 was this uh, actuator, the tuning valve run actuator linkage connector. Uh, it had come become disconnected on the bottom actuator, so it was still attached to the driving actuator at the top. And I didn't realize it. Uh, this part was, you know, not really visible. So I took it to a mechanic. He told me it was going to be a $1,200 repair and uh, that about half of that was labor and half of that was parts. And that, that's a pretty common quote that I've seen out on the Internet. So I went to the dealership, and they absolutely will not sell you that part uh, separate. You have to buy the manifold. So even if you do the work, you're still talking four, five, six hundred dollars, depending on where you get the part. So, you know, I did a little research online, and I found this guy selling these actuators. But you'll notice here that he uh, has a disclaimer on it that says, you know, hey, this is a used part, and oh by the way, you have to. Uh, apply a repair um, using a, a pin of some sort. So I'm going to kind of walk through the concept of how you would do this uh, using a secondhand used part that costs $50 uh, to illustrate the point. But your alternative is either do something like this or replace. Okay, so if you buy one of these parts, uh, you can see on the left here the sort of the concept of how this thing works. The actuator, the driver actuator, I believe, is the one at the top. You have a connector that reaches down to a lower actuator. Um, I think that's the tuning arm or whatever they call it, tuning actuator. So whenever the um, adjustment, uh, the driver actuator at the top uh, raises up, what you'll see is that it'll pivot and it will pull the lower actuator up and along the right side you can see uh, sort of a frontal view where you have the pivot points um, uh, for each of the upper and lower um, portion of the actuators so that connector rod tends to pop off of the connections at those two pivot points so the idea of this repair is that we're going to go in and drill two holes um, that are along the pivot axis of the actuators that'll go the holes should go all the way through the actuator arm and the, the connector itself at both locations and then we're going to slide a cotter pin or some type of uh, retaining pin in from the inside and anchor the connector to the actuators and do it in such a way that the uh, connector can still pivot at each of those two points, but um, it's connected, but it's not acting like 
a break. The, the cotter pin should not be um, so tight or the whatever pin you use, whatever mechanism you use, should not be so tight as to squeeze um, the connector and the actuator to where they won't move. So once the pin is in and secured, you should be able to rotate about the pivot points um, where the pin is acting like almost like an axle and uh, not acting like a brake. So what happens if your solution is not as simple as mine, just putting that one uh, connector back in place? What if you have to remove this? Um, one of the problems that you're going to face is finding uh, a good documentation on how to do the replacement yourself. Um, for example, this shot here uh, is from a GM website that specifically talks about the sonic uh, intake, removing the sonic intake um, manifold. And if you look real closely, what you see is the diagrams associated with a Chevy Cruze. The Cruze has the oil, the arrow at the bottom points to the front of the car, and the Chevy Cruze has its oil um, cap uh, toward the front driver's side, and the Sonic has the oil cap to the rear driver's side of that top uh, man of, uh, of that top covering. So, if you go out to the internet, you can't even find good documentation, or at least I couldn't find good documentation or good videos um, on how to get the thing removed. So, I'm going to transition here and walk you through what the thing looks like when it's out of the car so that you have some idea of the scope of what you have to do when you're uh, attempting to remove this on your own. This is how it's packed coming out of the box. It's basically got a foam casing on it. Okay, so this is the metal, the fuel, the shiny fuel uh, rail I think they call it. Um, what you'll notice is that that this is the approximate orientation when it's mounted in the car, looking from the front of the car. Got the uh, four cylinder intakes. Down here is a rubber uh, gasket, or you know, it's, it's, there's going to be some sort of support that you set it into. And then we'll go through each of the parts, uh, each of the connections, so that you have some idea of how many things to be looking for when you disconnect and uh, remove your intake manifold. So I'm going to roll it down here. I'm going to start with the part that caused the P0276. That was this guy right here. Um, there's a male and female adapter. You snap it in and it keeps these two actuator arms together. So if you can find that piece and restore it, you might not have to do this at all. <clears throat> right behind here is one electrical connector. Uh, looks like there's a uh, there's possibly another uh, bracket or something right here, but there's an electrical connector here, a hose here, two bolt holes here, four connectors across here, the four screw mounts here, an electrical connector here, an electrical connector here, a hose going into the purge. This is where the fuel line will hook in. The four holes for your throttle body. The two holes here to mount uh, to the engine. And then underneath, you're going to have this, uh, probably something to secure this right here. All right, let's get a little bit oriented to uh, in the, how the intake manifold is set in the car. You can see back here is where the intake manifold is. Everyone recommends that you, uh, that I've seen, recommends you take off the black uh, cover housing for the uh, in front of the uh, intake manifold. Um, I'm gonna move over here and kind of work in. Okay, it's real hard to see, but this is the uh, where the screwdriver is. This is the top end of the connector. Okay, if you come back out to orient you, here's the oil filler cap. You can put your hand down in here 
and you can come at it from the side and you can get at both the top you can get at the top one by putting your hand in this direction and you can get at the bottom end of the connector down in through this side and coming in from the driver's side if you look right here where the screwdriver is I don't know if you can really see it but right in here we'll see the uh, connection for this hose when we're looking at the manifold outside uh, and out of the box okay, I'm going to take the screwdriver or the light out here um, right here you can see the uh, fuel rail or not sure exactly what they call it but right here's the fuel connection there's a little yellow caution um, so there is a procedure referenced in the um, GM instructions to talk about depressurizing the fuel system so you might want to investigate that before you disconnect the fuel rail um, you can see here 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 and here are the four intake areas I don't know what they're called the purge valve we'll see that the purge valve is right here it's got an electrical connector here there's a hose that connects here um, it's hard to see can't, I can't see it right off the bat I'll show you where there's an electrical connector on this side as you come over to the passenger side the air box comes off the hose comes off and the throttle body I have a video that will show you how to pull that out so that you can get better easier access to this side okay so most of us have used a monitor before um, kind of come in here it scanned the car and notice that it says no codes so in theory I should be able to I just reset the uh, codes um, should be able to drive it you know what whatever 50 miles is sort of the urban legend and then uh, go get it inspected and uh, theoretically it'll pass right well not exactly so looking at the uh, safety inspection report from the first time that I did it I reset the codes I fixed the connector I reset the codes um, and I rode I drove the car for a hundred miles and then I went in to see you know get it inspected and it failed and it was not clear to me you know every, when you ask people they can't really tell you exactly how to to do this um, how to get the car ready for the inspection so this next section is going to talk a little bit about that uh, notice in this particular um, inspection that the evaporator system was not ready and the heated O2 was not ready so here was a car that did not have a check engine light on it it had been driven a hundred miles it had multiple um, restarts I had shut the car down a couple of times um, and it was still failing and so the question was why I mean how do I get this thing I to pass this scan. the inspection there's an important thing that you got to take away from it um, down here at the bottom monitors INC those are the monitors incomplete uh, at least in the state of Texas you can have one incomplete monitor for example this is the evaporator system but you cannot have uh, noticed that uh, this guy here is monitors incomplete is zero the last time I did this it was monitors incomplete was one and yesterday when I tried to get the car inspected it was monitors incomplete was two and in particular I had the uh, heater O2 monitor and the evaporator system monitors were not cleared so I could not get even though the engine check light was gone and I had driven a hundred miles I still couldn't get the car um, past the I'm going to go into the IM readiness, the monitor readiness. I'm going to go to the engines one. That's where my problems were. I'm going to hit enter. And then I'm going to use, since the DTC was cleared, that's basically since I reset and did my disconnected battery. Notice over here I've got three pages. Um, the two that were giving me trouble yesterday where the evaporator system was incomplete and you can see it's still incomplete 
and the O2 sensor heater was incomplete yesterday. This morning, I got up and I used the protocol that I found on the internet. Basically, you have to have a cold start. It has to be below, I think, 100 or 90 degrees. It has to, the car engine temperature has to be below 122 degrees. The car engine has to be within uh, 10 degrees of the ambient temperature. So basically, let it set overnight and cool off. Start the car. Let it idle for two and a half minutes with the air conditioner on and your back window heater turned on. They basically maximum electrical load. After two and a half minutes, go out and accelerate smoothly using half throttle up until 55 miles an hour. Then maintain 55 miles an hour with the cruise control if possible, but maintain 55 to 60 miles an hour for three minutes. Then you have to coast down without using the brakes. So release your cruise control and coast down. You might want to put your blinker lights on to 20 miles an hour without using the brakes. Then reaccelerate to 55 miles an hour, moderate, uh, mid, mid level acceleration. Set it at 55 miles an hour for five minutes. Then you have to coast down without using your brakes to a stop. I actually had to use my parking brake to, to get it to come to a complete stop. And uh, then idle, put it in park, idle the car for two and a half minutes, and then uh, shut it off, take the key out, open the door, and close the door. <clears throat> and that all has to be done on a cold start. Uh, and then that sensor will go from being incomplete to complete. Uh, some of the other tests are basically run the car for four minutes at idle, go out and do five minutes of stop and start, uh, stop and go kinds of uh, driving in town, and then idle for four minutes and shut it down. And that's supposed to clear, I think that's the one that clears the evaporator code, but it's supposed to cycle something. So that's kind of how you use this thing um, to help you, you know, navigate when's the car ready to be inspected because if you have two incomplete monitors even if everything else on the car is good it will not pass now once i had done that i went from having two um, incomplete monitors to having one incomplete monitor and you can see here the heated o2 um, cleared it, it became the status converted to ready and that was as a result of doing that um, you know zero to 55 um, protocol so the key is to use your um, scanner to tell you which systems are still not ready and do a little research on the internet of what you know what triggers the cycling of that event whether it's 50 miles or whether it's stop and go traffic or whether it's 55 miles for three minutes etc go figure out from the internet which uh, what what you have to do to clear the remaining um, monitors and get yourself down to having a single monitor and then you can go and get the vehicle inspected and as long as the safety features are good there's no check engine light and you have one monitor or less typically you're going to be able to get the vehicle uh, successfully inspected Okay, this is the second uh, video that I've done uh, related to the P2076. Uh, last year, I had a problem with same code. Uh, there were some supporting codes, and that's what led me down the throttle body um, path last year. Uh, so there's a video out there if you're interested in that. Uh, if you want to try and take a look at that first. Um, this one uh, was the result of that disconnected arm. Both of them give you the P2076 code. So uh, kind of do a little bit of research and troubleshooting before you go out and buy your $400 part. Uh, and uh, again, 400 to 600, depending on what, you know, where you get it. So hopefully this uh, helped you and um, good luck. And if you like the video, please uh, subscribe to the channel.